and um, here to introduce it is Karen Pearson. And um, thank you again for coming to the conference. And those of you who need to get a ride back, please come and let me know when the session is over, okay? Thank you. Hi, um, I'd like to welcome everybody. And um, I'm sorry I missed the day earlier. I had a five person out, but I hear it's been very interesting. We've lost a panelist. It's not going to be here today, but we're going to start with Lenita Jacobs here, who I think is um, listed as third in the program. Lenita is one of my colleagues here, uh, an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and the USC's um, relatively new the Department on American Studies and Ethnicity um, Division. It used to be a program, and um, it alone has transformed USC in the last few years. It's been a really amazing addition to, to USC. And um, Lenita is, as I said, an associate professor in her book, um, From the Kitchen to the Parlor, Language is Becoming an African American Women's Hair Care, is a great read. So I encourage you to look at it. And um, Lenita is going to go first, and we'll save questions for after the response. All right. Okay. Talking about Joan of Arcadia, which many of us had the privilege of uh, watching uh, during the last time we were together two years ago. Um, and I simply don't have enough time to sing its praises. I was very much a fan of the show. I ducked under my desk with the, the DVD set and a flashlight and a pen and a pad. And I, I, I know, it was just transformative. I don't know if any, anybody else had so much pleasure uh, watching, watching a show. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to use my time to point out some of the show's uh, limitations around representations of, of, of race. So uh, Joan of Arcadia uh, was on CBS for uh, I guess two short years. And it centered around Joan Girardi, who's played by Amber Tamlin. Uh, she's a modern-day Joan of Arc and self-described sub-defective at her cliquish high school. Um, her daily conversations with the tangible, chameleonish gods spanning various ages, genders, professions, and ethnicities, and even sexual orientations uh, resonated deeply with me. Uh, but it was Joan's brother, Kevin, played by Jason Ritter, who intrigued me the most. Uh, Kevin's high school athletic career is cut short after a car accident renders him a paraplegic, uh, and Kevin's attempts to reconcile his old and new selves uh, were especially vivid and renewed my appreciation for the tremendous work of recovery. Uh, now, Jane and Diane will tell you that I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I was going to write. I spent uh, too much time <laughs> thinking about uh, Kevin and the work that he did on the boat in the basement. He was just like a contemporary Noah. And then I went from there to thinking about him using humor as a coping, research, um, coping resource and, and how his humor evolved. Uh, but they were able to see my most impassioned uh, remarks lay in the margins of these uh, drafts that I would send to them. And they centered around uh, how Kevin, uh, played by Jason Ritter, his father, and Arcadia Police Chief Will, played by Joe Montagna, and sister Joan were incessantly framed as good whites uh, within racially charged plot lines, including non-white supporting cast members that seemed to occupy scenes only to highlight the Girardi's good intentions. Thus, the key concern for me in critiquing the show uh, became fairness and accountability uh, concerning matters of race. Uh, my critique concerns the show's use of uh, the BBF, uh, the best black friend. Uh, Los Angeles Times writer Greg Braxton describes BBFs in, uh, in a clever play on grade school BFFs, best friends forever, right? BBFs are often played by gorgeous, independent, successful, and loyal African-American actresses whose character's primary function is to support the heroine, often with sass, attitude, and a salty but wise insight into relationships and life. Often, this character helps to humanize and nuance white, often female or gay male characters, to the detriment of her fuller uh, development. Um, some have said the same about blacks as uh, deities. Um, and so far as these characters exploit the mis mysticism, and in some cases, even a kind of the marginalization of Af African diasporic religious practices. And I couldn't help but think about that when I saw the lost clip. Or when I think about The Matrix, uh, or when I think about Touched by an Angel. Um, so a significant character in this regard for Kevin is, uh, play, uh, is Rebecca Askew, who's played by Sidney Timia Portier, an African-American woman who serves as Kevin's editor and boss at the Arcadia Herald, as well as his short-lived romantic interest. 
Admittedly, Roma uh, Rebecca's romantic involvement with Kevin means that her character is not entirely commensurate with this uh, archetype of the BDF. Um, Kevin is a heterosexual man, and Rebecca becomes much more than a friend to Kevin over the course of their relationship. Nevertheless, by the time she exits the show in the first season, Rebecca is less a character in her own right than a point of reference that helps to define Kevin's moral evolution. The use of secondary black characters to nurture the growth of whites at the center of primetime television dramas is one of the more subtle conventions shaping the representation of race in popular culture. A televised depiction of friendly interaction between blacks and whites might appear to be taking risks in the ongoing national conversations about race, but when the roundness of black characters is diminished across subsequent episodes, the result is a reiteration of the two-dimensional portrait of blacks offered by the myth of white normativity. Accordingly, although uh, Rebecca is not a stock BBF, her character's complexity and promise are squandered over several episodes, and at best she becomes a positive foil for Kevin and his father Will, insofar as she shores up their good intentions and morality and serves, um, much like Kevin's accident did, to bring his family closer together as they corroborate some of her more positive assessments of real even, uh, Will eventually. So Kevin meets uh, Rebecca because she offers him a job. But one of the things I appreciate, appreciate about the show is, is, is its rigor. And it's exemplified by the fact that Re Rebecca's blessed bestowal of a job is not without its complications for Kevin. Uh, and several of these complications bring matters of race, disability, and relative privilege center stage. So here is what happens uh, during Kevin's first day at work. He goes in search of Rebecca and overhears her in the break room, room talking with Andy Reese, uh, the newspaper's obnoxious style editor. And their conversation concerns uh, Kevin's hiring and his perceived limitations as a fact checker. It is not uh, inspiring. Uh, it is not flattering, rather. So let's see what happens. As this loads. under my desk and I said, what, 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 really? Did they just attempt to square disability with racial marginalization? Did Rebecca just confront Kevin's sense of privilege as a white male despite his disability? Further, did Kevin just resist her attempts in this regard? 
Here, JOA or Joan of Arcadia offers a rare but welcome glimpse into issues of disability, race, and white privilege. This exchange establishes race and disability as potential points of alignment and misalignment between Kevin and Rebecca. Whereas Kevin perceives his disability as a barrier that both marginalizes him in the workplace and alienates him from Rebecca, she suggests that her ethnic minority status affords her an empathetic window into his new foreign marginalization and his white male privilege. Specifically, Rebecca will not let Kevin believe that his marginalization as a di disabled person erases his privilege as a white, attractive, and smart man. But she also offers him an opportunity to navigate these struggles without self-pity or self-congratulatory liberalism, which he firmly rejects. This is a bold interventionist move on the part of the show's writers. Whereas whiteness persists by remaining unstated and unmarked, the writers create a narrative circumstance that shines a light on Kevin's whiteness. This scene of one of, is one of several instances that push the boundaries of how race is discussed in primetime TV. This scene goes one step further by placing disability on the table as well. Race is pit against disability by two equally impassioned young people, Kevin and Rebecca, in ways that ultimately sidestep concerns about who has suffered the most to center on several richer and morally laden questions. How will I be known, both now and in the future? What kind of person will I be? How will I respond to cruelty and simplifying generalizations based on race, disability, and, and or gender? In posing these questions as prerequisites for their learning to relate to one another, Rebecca has undertaken her first act as Kevin's moral compass. Now, while it's certainly important to remember that whiteness is complex and crisscrossed crisscross by other identifications that can change its meaning, Kevin's inability to see his white male privilege by virtue of his disability and suffering makes him intolerant and even hostile to Rebecca's intervention. Kendall notes that this is typical of many white and even liberal whites, especially if they perceive themselves to be marginalized in some way, Kendall writes. For those of us who are white and are disabled, gay, lesbian, or straight women, our experiences of being excluded from the mainstream hides, us, hides from us the fact that we still benefit from our skin color. By seeing ourselves as removed in some way from the privileged group, we may be all the more deaf to our silencing of people of color. White privilege, Kendall adds, enables many European Americans not to see race in themselves and to be angry, like Kevin, at those who do. If Rebecca has the last word in this conversation, Kevin exacts the figurative last word near the episode's end. He interrupts the conversation between Rebecca and Andy to deliver an eloquent and pithy exposition on the difference between a hoodie and a puncho. Um, I wonder if I can play this. I wonder if it, it'll show up. Because the way it goes down is a beautiful thing. <laughs> I hope you guys can forgive me this, this, the bit sloppy. I didn't want this to be here, but. I'll fall on that sword when I come to it, but you don't work for me. And I, it's not a person who falls by the board if you ask me to do something as a result of practice. Sorry. If that's the party for you, you want to take out of here, I can't stop you. I've got your things to go. This is the last time that happens, okay? Um, all right. I want you guys to see how this goes down. No, it looks exactly the same. Yes, the top is tight, but the bottom is mushroom. Um, a hoodie is a sweatjacket with a hood. It applies to a zip-up or a pullover. A poncho is a triangular piece of knitted fabric with a hole in the middle. You're experiencing a comeback. Excuse me, I have work to do. All right. Some reviewers uh, suggested that Kevin's comment served as a rejoinder to both Andy and Rebecca. They surmised that he had justifiably thumbed his nose at Andy for calling him an inept fact checker and at Rebecca too for her insensitive reference to his wheelchair dependency. But I'm not entirely uh, convinced that Kevin meant for his speechifying to be taken that way or that Rebecca in particular received it as such. First, I don't know if you guys noticed, but Kevin directs his commentary to um, Andy in particular. Secondly, if one looks closely at Rebecca and Andy's faces in this scene, one will notice that Andy's expression uh, is one of embarrassment, whereas uh, Rebecca is looking at uh, him with a sense of pride. Um, yeah, well, I'm not going to wait for that. Okay. Um, I identified deeply with Rebecca's gaze and its antecedents and saw in it a moment of tremendous possibility, both for primetime TV and everyday life. First, she outs Kevin's white privilege, that elusive everything and nothing quality of whiteness that pervades media depictions and everyday culture without apology. 
Okay. Then after he delivers his retort, she does not acquiesce through an apology or inflated gratitude. Instead, she looks at him and appreciates the part of him that is accountable to and for the lessons of their prior exchange. In my mind, she beckons viewers to extrapolate similar lessons in accountability concerning whiteness. Now, what does Kevin ultimately take from this pivotal conversation? He deduces that Rebecca would not pity him, and he reminds her of this in future episodes. But, and this is what I stress, as the show progresses, Kevin displays far less enduring appreciation for Rebecca's insights into his privilege as a white male. The latter lesson is not one that he seems, is not one he seems to retain. Rebecca, in turn, displays heightened sensitivity to Kevin's struggle with his disability, but seems to forget the racialized aspect of their relationship as the sexual tension increases between them in subsequent episodes. In fact, Rebecca begins to assume more of a caretaking role, shielding Kevin from reporter's cynical remarks about his father, Chief uh, Girardi, and nurturing his natural talents as a writer. Um, there are ways in which she's especially protective of him uh, that, that kind of gets her in trouble. Uh, arguably, her efforts to protect him are a testament to her fairness as a journalist and her mounting concern for Kevin's sense of well-being at work. Nevertheless, there remain risky interventions that jeopardize not just Kevin, uh, but also her own moral standing. Specifically, some of her interventions um, jeopardize her own hard-won status as an ethical news journalist who does not tolerate favoritism or respond, uh, in one case, uh, Chief Gerard is accused of uh, having officers who are engaged in police brutality. There's a huge Rodney King-like beating, and uh, the reporters are sitting around talking about it. And she, as the uh, editor, stops their conversation and says, oh, no, I think the editor, I, I think the chief is doing the right thing. I think, I think it's OK. Um, so when she does these kinds of interventions, uh, it jeopardizes her hard-won status as a kind of editor who does not respond lightly to police brutality against unarmed African Americans. Now, one important consequence of Rebecca's intervention is that she is no longer challenging Kevin. Instead, she is protecting and comforting him in the midst of racially charged situation that is some ways more challenging than their initial exchange. Okay. Uh, Rebecca's continued interventions on behalf of Kevin and then his father will eventually uh, undermine uh, her hard-won uh, reputation. Uh, a perfect case in point occurs when she, Kevin, and other reporters view a subsequent televised statement uh, after that Rodney King uh, beating like uh, thing, uh, Rebecca continues to take the chief's fairness and goodness at face value. After Chief Girardi announces in this televised report that the officers involved in the beating will be indicted and apologize to the victim's family, a skeptical reporter named Dave turns off the TV and scoffs and says, okay, we'll see if it happens. Rebecca then ventures not one but two caveats that are meant to trouble this reporter's read. She says, he just sat there indicting the guys. When Dave retorts, yeah, so a white jury can exonerate them, she asks, well, that's not up to the chief of police. Incredulous, uh, Dave, the reporter, asks, since when do you defend the cops? When Rebecca struggles to form a coherent response, he cuts her off by saying, maybe you're just hot for his son. Okay. The newsroom clears on that awkward, and it turns out, truthful note, <laughs> leaving Rebecca and Kevin to sort through the aftermath. And what's troubling for me is that Dave's remark, you know, is, is that it points to, um, toward the fact that at this point in the series, race and matters of fairness have been displaced by a focus on the sexual tension between Rebecca and Kevin. Now, to be fair to the series, these issues do not fall away entirely. Indeed, they receive some attention from Kevin and Rebecca, but more as fleeting acknowledgments than subjects for serious consideration. Towards the end of their fractured courtship, other complicating factors will emerge that attest to the writer's attempts to complicate their relationship. Uh, these factors include Rebecca's status as Kevin's boss, what Kevin calls Rebecca's big honk in education, their age differences, Kevin's disability, and his concern that he was hired because of his relationship to the police chief, and ultimately Kevin's insecurities around intimacy. Uh, these factors emerge as necessary and even welcome complications in the budding romance between the two characters. Yet most of them are dismissed as irrelevant, since what really scares Kevin is coming to terms with his sexual identity following his accident. Sexual desire, or more precisely, fears about sexual dysfunction, will trump all other factors in his relationship with Rebecca. Uh, I want to use the final uh, minutes that I have to play a, uh, play a clip that shows a similar um, dynamic playing out between another African American female protagonist, uh, Lieutenant uh, Tony Williams, who is uh, the partner to Chief Will Girardi. And, uh, well, what happens is that, uh, sorry. 
Kevin writes an editorial. He's now a writer, thanks to Rebecca's mentorship. Uh, he writes an article indicting the chief of police's uh, zero tolerance policy for graffiti, and he calls it racist. And uh, his father is obviously upset and goes to work upset, uh, but he is consoled soon by his partner. concerning the racial fairness of this policy. Her silence does not diminish the power of validation procured by her race. The mere fact that the actress is black validates her character's assessment of this racial matter and by extension, Will's goodness. Will's response is telling since it reveals his reluctance to figure Lieutenant Williams' race as relevant to her comments. Um, I have a lot of things to say about this, but I'm, I'm gonna rush. But what I wanted to say is that what's interesting is how her race is exploited uh, in another instance, so in a prior exchange, uh, he asks her to speak on the, the fairness of a certain kind of policy, and he doesn't say it, but we know that her race is very relevant here. But in this episode, he stresses her identity as a cop. So I think that what's interesting about that positioning is that Lieutenant Williams' race is likewise exploited towards multiple ends in both of these exchanges. Either way, Will emerges as a good guy, first for appreciating her race as relevant to claims about racist cops, and second by ignoring her race in favor of her status as a cop and weighing the merits of a policy that disproportionately affects blacks and other minorities. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop here. The last uh, clip I was going to show was of Joan uh, double dutching with a, a, a black homeless girl who they called uh, Casper because she disappears. And uh, the scene shows them um, double dutching together. Joan means to help this girl, but in the end, the girl goes away in search of her father. And as they jump together, there's a kind of very cheesy rap ditty that proclaims their ethnic unification. And it's really this kind of multicultural celebration of interracial harmony and uh, unity. Um, now, some of you might say, you know, am I asking too much from primetime TV? Um, Perhaps, but for me, my expectations of the show were not unlike my expectations of students in my discussions about race and privilege. When I discuss these issues with them, it helps, I'm, I'm, ending, I'm ending now, it helps if I acknowledge that the work is difficult for me as an African American, lest my white students confuse my comments as a black rant, or other non-white students become resistant to the task of examining their relative privileges. It, especially, it is especially helpful, too, if my comments are as, are as sincere and unambiguous as Rebecca's initial intervention with Kevin. If my students meet me halfway in this vulnerable exercise, I must return to them a gaze like hers, one that is neither apologetic nor overly gracious, but instead appreciative. If I have any hope for influencing the way they think and behave, I must love them that much. My appreciation for Joan of Arcadia and its cast lingers still amidst this critical testament. Kevin and Rebecca's relationship reveals TV's considerable promise, as well as its incessant limitations in telling stories about race, whiteness, and disability. It also reminds us that we must nurture not just faith, but accountability when representing these messy and moral issues. Thank you.
discourses on world religions. His speciality is the study of contemporary Muslim societies in North America. And he's the author of Oil and Water. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. What is that? Thank you. Um, it's a delight to, to be here at uh, SC. I always, when I come here, try to drive by the shrine. I did that this morning, the Shrine Auditorium. Uh, it's a wonderful image for me. Uh, Gozer Haider is a Muslim architect in North America, and he talks about first coming to LA and, as a Muslim, seeing these domes and thinking, well, that must be the mosque, and going and being a little disappointed that, in fact, it wasn't the local mosque, uh, made him realize that the image and the reality in Los Angeles may be a little bit uh, different. <laughs> uh, since we are in Los Angeles, uh, let me take most of my time to talk about me. Uh, <laughs> I came to Canada in 1970 from Pakistan with my parents. At that point, there were about 34,000 Muslims in Canada. Uh, in 2001, there were about 580,000 Muslims in Canada. Uh, while that population has grown tremendously in North America, we, self-identifying as a Muslim, are almost totally absent from characters on television. Uh, as a kid, I had Haji from uh, Johnny Quest as the only Muslim that I could identify on television, uh, with the added bonus that he was also East Indian. Um, I was a little puzzled as to how a child had made the trip to Mecca and had become, uh, uh, earned the title of Haji. Uh, a little more confused in the 1990s when his surname was Haji Singh, which is a, a Sikh name, so how he was a, a Muslim and a Sikh at the same time <laughs> was, was a little puzzling. Um, we, of course, had Jamie Farr on MASH uh, playing Max Klinger, but as a Lebanese Christian, of course, not as a Muslim. Uh, Tony Shalhoub uh, as Monk in, uh, in Monk, brilliant detective but suffering from uh, OCD. Uh, most of the Arabs on television, or Casey Kasem on radio, in fact, were Christian and not uh, Muslim. Uh, Elijah talked about his, his moment of you know, realization of adult television. For me, it was watching Roots in 1977 and was amazed to learn that Kunta Kinte uh, was a Muslim. Uh, I'd known about African-American athletes who converted to Islam, uh, Ali, the greatest who came to Sunni Islam by the nation, uh, Kareem, sorry to mention a Bruin here, uh, who came straight into Sunni Islam. In 1978, uh, the character that Tim Reed played, Venus Flytrap, in WKRP in Cincinnati, uh, one of the episodes in the final season had him being arrested, uh, a case of mistaken identity, and the detective in an elevator asking if he was a Muslim. Uh, and I love that pronunciation of Muslim. Um, we've had a huge increase in the Muslim population in North America. And yet the number of Muslim characters have remained negligible. The few that do exist are of alien, violent men. And that's the, what I want to talk about is Muslim portrayals in the two seasons of Sleeper Cell, uh, the first show on American TV created to examine Muslim lives post 9-11. Um, we could talk about characters in shows like Oz, Elijah mentioned uh, the Kareem Saeed character, in Lost, the Saijara character, uh, in 24, in JAG, CSIS, the unit. But I don't think they'd add anything to this argument that Muslims aren't recognized in American television as ordinary citizens of this country, but instead portrayed as dangerous immigrants with a religion that is alien and evil. Moreover, their lived religion, using the subtitle of our book, consists solely of expressions of violence. There seems to be no other substantive practice that embodies Islamic faith on television. Uh, at this point, I, I want to thank both Jane and Diane for inviting me into this book project, and also for the, the panel on uh, Wednesday. For those of you that weren't here, uh, had a wonderful panel, God, Good and Evil, on Terror and Torture. And that, for me, was my, I'm so grateful that I lived to see this day, because I would never thought I would live to see this day. In the question and answer period, you had, uh, Kamran Pasha was one of the panelists, and he's one of the few Muslims working in Hollywood. And he's talking about this new series he's doing, Kings, based on uh, the portrayal of King David. And he talked about King David as a terrorist, which raised the ire of, of someone in the audience who said, as a Jew, she was concerned about a Muslim 
representing her religion on television. And I thought, this is brilliant. We finally come full circle, where you've got people concerned that Muslims are stereotyping other characters on TV. Um, it's not great, but you, you live with what you can. Yeah. Um, the media, it's almost impossible to overstate the role of the media in forming impressions of Islam and Muslims in the US. Now, you see this, for example, with the news media. Now, uh, before 9-11, I'd start my courses standard introduction to Islam, because my students didn't know a lot about Islam. Post 9-11, I started with books that talked about the media, particularly how television constructs uh, reality. Because my students now all of a sudden thought they knew everything about Islam, but that knowledge came from television, not from the ways in which the majority of Muslims understand their own faith. Uh, and you see this in, in polls. Uh, the, the Pew poll uh, in 2007 indicated that while 58% of Americans said they knew not very much or nothing about Islam, 70% said that Islam was very different from their own religion. Uh, I, I love that. 58% said they know nothing about it, yet 70% say that it's different. 35% uh, held unfavorable op opinions of Muslims. American Muslims simply at 29%. The only group rated lower than us as Muslims, of course, were atheists, uh, unfavorable to 53% of those surveyed. On TV, uh, you have these very poor representations of Muslims. I, I asked my students, so name a Muslim on television. You know, and there's usually a dead silence. And then someone comes up with Apu from The Simpsons. And then someone else says, but Apu's a Hindu. He's not a Muslim. Uh, Dave Chappelle is probably the most famous Muslim on television. And yet none of the characters on Chappelle's show are Muslim. Then we get to those characters that we talked about. Kareem Saeed on. Uh, Kareem Said on Lost, Saeed Jarrah. I always get confused because the Muslim character somehow is always called Saeed, which uh, also uh, puzzles me uh, a little bit. As someone points out wrestlers on uh, television, they're all heels, the Muslim uh, wrestlers. And television doesn't reflect the reality of, but a surprise, television doesn't reflect the reality of American Muslim life. Most notably the fact that American Muslims are equal in wealth and higher educational achievement than non-Muslims. Uh, the Newsweek cover story from 2007 on Islam in America, 26% of American Muslims had household incomes above 75,000 compared to 28% of non-Muslims, 24% of American Muslims graduate from university or done graduate work compared to 25% of non-Muslims. So Muslims were just as high as uh, any other group in terms of academic achievement and wealth. And the majority of American Muslims are professionals engineers, doctors, professors, lawyers, business owners. Uh, Jenny Abdo, in her book Mecca and Main Street about American Muslims, talks about this, dispelling the stereotypes of Muslims as un-American. In fact, they're the American success story. And yet you don't see this. You know, what you see are those different images. Uh, those of us who are academics, if you haven't picked up your copy of the Chronicle of Higher Education this week, you'll notice a DVD insert, uh, Obsession. Radical Islam's War with the West. That's now an insert into the, the, uh, this week's uh, uh, chronicle. Those of you that live in swing states, you'll get that mailed to you. Uh, check your mailboxes. Uh, Elijah, it'll be interesting to see if when you get home you have this uh, in your mailbox. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that's being put out there as images of Islam. And there's nothing new here. Jack Shaheen has written the classic book, Real Bad Arabs on the ways in which 19th and 20th century film depicted Arabs and Muslims as bloodthirsty men or um, women who were either silent or oppressed. Uh, this trend, of course, increased after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where the bad guy now becomes um, Muslims, used to be communists. And I get it. I understand television melodrama and the good guys, bad guys sense of things. You have to have a good guy, you have to have a bad guy. At this point, we as Muslims are the bad guys. You know, uh, I understand that, except the problem is things work both ways. TV borrows from the headlines. We've talked about those rip from the headline kinds of stories. 
uh, Sleeper Cell did this. Kamran Pasha, who was the, one of the producers who was here on Wednesday, talked about that. You know, the episode that he did, episode four of the first season with the Yemeni cleric, that's straight out of the headlines. And on the discussion on Wednesday about torture, that the torture performed on 24 is directly connected to the actual torture that actual Americans uh, perform you know, in Iraq, in Guantanamo, in Abu Ghraib. I want to talk about Showtime's uh, sleeper cell. Picking on that because it really was the first show created, and Kamran uh, talked about this on Wednesday, created post 9-11 specifically to deal with representations of Muslims. And I remember getting the promo for this from Showtime in 2005 called um, Know Your Enemy. And this starts, this promo, Know Your Enemy, starts with Yo-Yo Ma and uh, Alison Krauss, uh, Alison singing Slumber My Darling. Children of Lullaby over uh, images of children's drawings, post 9-11, children's drawings in reaction to 9-11. And the message is perfectly clear. Our kids are at risk. Will we slumber through another horrific attack? In a conversation between the series star, Michael Ely, and two of the advisors uh, to the show, included as a bonus feature on the DVD, uh, the first season DVD, the issue of racial profiling was raised. I'd love in the conversation to talk uh, with people about that. It's ironic here to see an African-American actor talking about profiling Muslims and troubling to hear the response that it was necessary to profile anyone who was traditional Muslim looking. And that's what Michael said, traditional Muslim looking. And you want to say, well, given the diversity of the Muslim world, particularly in North America, what does that mean? You know, 25% of us are African American, one third of us are South Asian, some of us are Middle Eastern, some of us are Iranian, some of us are uh, Caucasian, some of us are Latinos. You know, who are you going to profile? But the cast was interesting of Sleeper Cell, for those unfamiliar with it. It's a multi ethnic cast a Bosnian, an Arab, a French convert, an American convert, and an African-American star. Uh, I actually had the creators, uh, Ethan Reif and Cyrus Voorhees, uh, come to LMU and screen the pilot at my university and talk about this. And, and, and there's an ambivalence here. So on the one hand, you've got for the first time, and Kamran Pasha talked about this, a Muslim-American hero. Michael Ely's uh, character is an American Muslim hero. It also deals with some of the nuances of Muslim life that are absent from the television screen. Very simple things. People celebrating a child's birthday. Notions about dietary restrictions. Washing before the prayer. The day-to-day -day stuff, the lived religion of being a Muslim in America. Except, of course, it perpetuates the old stereotypes about Muslim violence, suggesting that any Muslim could be a terrorist. Uh, there are two seasons of the show in 2005, 2006, and again, there's much to admire in both seasons. Sometimes one gets a very nuanced portrait of American uh, Muslim life and the hard realities uh, for Muslims in a post 9-11 world. But the show is also deeply problematic. The Muslim hero, Mike Lealy, is caught up in cycles of violence and revenge. There are Muslim terrorists who are planning a, their next attack on American soil. But this show somehow makes all American Muslims objects of suspicion. In the commentaries for the show, the creators talked about the first Gulf War as the key moment for Islamic radicalism. In doing so, they were off by over a decade. Uh, for many of us as scholars of Islam, that radicalization took place in 1979 with the revolution in Iran and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Ignoring the events of 1979 allow us to forget America's role in the development of radical Islam selling weapons to both Iran and Iraq during their war. These days when we worry about Iran, and rightly so, you know, uh, having perhaps nuclear capabilities, no one's bringing up Iran-Contra, where our president sold weapons to the Iranians. Or what about the largest CIA uh, operation in history to gather, arm, and train the Mujahideen, who of course would become the Taliban. Um, the sh in the show, they talked about the fact that they were balanced in the sense that one of them was to the right, uh, meaning one of the creators, uh, that one of the directors was to the left. And I keep thinking now of John Stewart's great line when he's interviewed uh, by Bill Moyers on Now, thinking, well, 
that's television, where we say if we've got the left and we've got the right, we've got both perspectives. You know, cartoon characters have more than that. Cartoon characters at least have up and down. You know, there's more to it than it's the left and it's the right. Um, both the creators mentioned, for example, they, they were going to show an American beheaded on the first season, but didn't because of the actual number of Americans beheaded in Iraq in the fall of 2004. It's understandable, uh, of course, but I wonder why they didn't deal with the fact that many more Iraqi civilians have been killed in the Iraq war than American soldiers or private contractors. They talked about Iraq being the undercurrent for the second season of the show, which it was, and how there were Muslims exporting violence around the world. Left unsaid, of course, was the American role in exporting violence to Iraq. In discussing the rendition of the main terrorist uh, character, uh, played by Oded Fair, the, characters, the creators talk about him being sent to Saudi Arabia to be tortured, as if he wasn't tortured by the CIA in America. In that episode, they have the CIA officer saying, quote, Americans hate this shit. It's not who we are. Unfortunately, as all the investigation into torture in the US show, it is unfortunately who we are. And in talking about the real life Yemeni judge who was portrayed in the episode that Kamran uh, showed on Wednesday, one of the creators was saying that he was turning Muslims away from extremism. In fact, he's turning terrorists away from terrorism. Uh, this equation of Muslims with terrorists was quite uh, troubling. Uh, Kamran's talked about how he saw immigrants being portrayed in different stages on television and film. First as objects of fear, then in comedy, finally in drama. I think clearly we're still in that first stage with portrayals of Muslims in America. A slight shift, I think, to that comedic part, uh, Aliens in America. Uh, the show that unfortunately was, is uh, cancelled as far as I, I know uh, with the Raja character as the young Pakistani exchange student uh, as a Canadian having to represent uh, Little Mosque on the Prairie, you know, a hit show in Canada that's a comedy show where you actually do have that comedic portrayal of Muslim life and I think we're moving hopefully to that third part, that straightforward dramatic role. And let me end on, on this note. Uh, there's very few Muslims that are involved in the television industry. Uh, Kamran Pasha who talked about uh, one very few. Not surprisingly, it's Sleeper Cell, the show that he's involved with, that has positive portrayals of Muslims. Until Muslims become more involved in television and film, we will leave the telling of our own stories to others. As such, while we can and should protest against inaccurate descriptions, we cannot expect others to tell our stories in ways that we would like them to be told. And that's what you see on CBC, The Little Mosque on the Prairie. The reason that show was made is a Muslim woman, Zarka Nawaz, grows up in Toronto, moves with her family to Regina, sets up life on the Saskatchewan Prairie. And she wants to tell that story and is able to do that. Uh, let me end with a line from one of my, my favorite uh, letters that James Baldwin wrote to his nephew and namesake. He's writing about race, of course, but his lines are equally applicable about religion. And James writes this, but these men are your brothers, your lost younger brothers. And if the word integration means anything, this is what it means, that we would love shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. For this is your home, my friend. Do not be driven from it. Great men have done great things here and will again. And we can make America what America must become. We, as Muslims, must help in the construction of an America where our stories are told for what they are, part of this nation's fabric. Can everyone hear me if I, if I speak from here? 
Is that, uh, is that all right? I, just, I need to, to do some reading from my computer, and it's a little awkward up there. Um, so uh, let me start first. Uh, you know, I, I, I should apologize for having to get up in the middle of Amir's uh, uh, talk. Um, I uh, have my cell phone's on silent, and I've been uh, at some point in the day expecting a phone call about a potential family emergency. Uh, and I thought it was the phone call was going to come later, but it came uh, unfortunately in the middle of your speech. Fortunately, everything's okay, so uh, I'm coming back to give the, uh, which I may not have otherwise. Uh, but you know, I can assure you that uh, uh, I, I read all the papers in advance. So uh, uh, you know, unless he went way off script, uh, I, I don't think I missed anything. Uh, and uh, you know, I should note, uh, you know, something about my uh, my in into this topic. I'm not really um, a, a scholar of, of religion or religious studies. My my sort of in into this topic uh, has really come from the fact that I'm, I'm the general editor of American Quarterly, and last September we did a special issue, guest edited by uh, Marie Griffith and Melanie McAllister, uh, on uh, religion and politics in the contemporary United States. Uh, and for me, it was a real uh, crash course. Uh, in what has turned out to be a, a, a fascinating field for me uh, that ends up, I see, intersecting with many of the, the interests I have but didn't know that they intersected with uh, uh, religious studies. But that, that sort of framing, the uh, relationship between religion, spirituality, and uh, politics, especially in the United States, uh, I think will, will, will frame uh, uh, my remarks. Um, unfortunately, we didn't uh, get a chance to hear Rudy Busto's paper on heroes, uh, but I was able to read it. And so as I go through my comments at the beginning, you'll, you'll get a brief sort of taste of what the paper is about. And then by the end, uh, I will briefly describe uh, you know, what I take to be the central thesis uh, and raise a few questions. And I think the thesis, while not being able to do justice to it in all its detail, will, will still be enough to perhaps generate a conversation. Uh, but I want to start by uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, thanking everyone for coming, uh, thanking Diane Winston for inviting me to, uh, uh, to uh, be uh, uh, a commentator, and uh, you know, thank our panelists for uh, some very uh, uh, rich uh, and uh, fascinating uh, uh, papers. And uh, you know, uh, again, I can't do justice to all of their details, but I wanted to start off by at least sketching out what I take to be one common feature of uh, uh, the three papers. Uh, and uh, that is, it seems to me, their critical analysis of the ways in which racialized and or immigrant characters on contemporary television shows minister to the spiritual and material needs of US Americans. So uh, Professor Jacobs Huey focuses on black female characters, uh, variations on the BBF, who support the spiritual development of white men, notably a white police officer. Um, uh, Professor Hussein foregrounds, among other uh, characters, Darwin Al Said, an undercover Muslim FBI agent who worked to protect the U.S. from terrorist attacks. Um, and finally, uh, 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 Professor Busto, in his paper, analyzes uh, uh, a character from Heroes, a Japanese immigrant time bender and a South Asian sort of doctor scientist who together uh, work to save the uh, white cheerleader and a world largely represented uh, by the United States. Uh, now, it seems to me that while the broader ideological significance of these different racialized helper figures uh, are overdetermined, there's probably a lot of uh, things one could say about them. Uh, I am particularly interested in the way in which such figures or characters could be uh, said to mediate, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, material reality or uh, materialist context. Uh, because in each instance, the characters who serve others uh, do so in, in work or labor context, and that's often focused on and uh, foregrounded about uh, the character. So on Joan of Arcadia, black women prop up white men on the job uh, at the newspaper and uh, in the police department. Um, and you know, it's important uh, to keep in mind, uh, given the ubiquity of police procedurals, uh, that police shows are also work shows. There are also shows about uh, doing a, a job. And so I would say something similar about Sleep Cell, uh, where uh, you have um, a figure of the Muslim agent working for the FBI uh, within the diegesis or the plot of the show. And that figure is, I think, interestingly doubled by the uh, Arabic and Islamic cultural advisors uh, who work behind the scenes for the show, notably Kamran Pasha. Uh, who, uh, who we've heard a little bit about. And then the Japanese immigrant time shifter from Heroes is partly defined anachronistically as a kind of Japanese salaryman whose uh, job becomes uh, partly uh, saving the planet. And you know, in addition, what's interesting is that the actor who plays that character, uh, and this is something that Busto talks about, his star image uh, 
uh, is forever linked to the fact that he used to work for George Lucas's uh, Industrial Light and Magic as a uh, computer programmer. So, you know, in all of these cases, these sort of racialized helper figures are partly marked by their status as, as, uh, as uh, not only servants or people who serve, but as, as workers in some way. Uh, you know, all of which suggest possible connections between spiritual and material labor, raising questions about how and why U.S. American viewers at this particular moment take pleasure in imagining the labor of people of color and immigrants um, in, in these contexts. Uh, so now I want to turn to, to uh, uh, each individual paper and uh, raise a series of, of questions. Uh, Professor Jacob Huey's uh, talk uh, prevents a really a, a, a subtle um, and illuminating analysis of the intersection of uh, uh, race and uh, disability. Uh, that, you know, for me, I think was especially uh, uh, bracing. I was uh, particularly struck by how in her analysis the juxtaposition of disability and blackness generates insights into the nature of whiteness, as well as the articulation of possible convergences among different kinds of privileges and exclusion, however foreshortened uh, as the particular season she's talking about of the show developed. Um, and you know, I have just uh, you know, three sort of uh, questions or, or, or comments to make about the paper. Uh, you know, first, in addition to uh, her excellent uh, uh, thematic readings of uh, the television show, um, I would uh, uh, encourage Professor Jacob Huey to engage other elements of televisual analysis and meaning, including perhaps production context, reception history, and televisual elements of televisual form. Among other things, it would be interesting to know about the writing process and the extent to which the producers of the show consulted experts or interest groups uh, links to issues of race or disability. I, I sort of suspect that they may have done that kind of work around issues of disability, uh, but for reasons that, that Professor Jacob Huey sort of analyzes in the paper, may not have done that around issues of whiteness uh, and, uh, and race. You know, I don't think they, they, they talked to George Lipsitz or uh, 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 Noel uh, uh around whiteness. Uh, and uh, you know, perhaps uh, 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 Professor uh, Jacob Chewy could, could enlighten us on that, or, or, or why that might be the case that they, they wouldn't think they needed information about, um, about race and whiteness. Uh, it would perhaps also make sense to test the essay's readings against fan responses, or at least to know more uh, about the show's uh, target demographics. So one of the things that's sort of fascinating about uh, 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 Jacob Chewy's paper is the way in which she in part focuses on the black female gaze. Um, and I wonder to what extent that is um, idiosyncratic to her own positionality. In other words, is she finding things in the show? It, it, was the show meant for her? Did the show imagine uh, a, a, a black female spectator or not? Is its target audience, in fact, uh, uh, you know, white folks of a particular uh, demographic? I, I just don't know. It would be interesting to know. Finally, and perhaps most importantly from my perspective, it would be interesting to investigate the ways in which Joan of Arcadia uses formal elements to represent whiteness and disability. One of the, uh, the sources that uh, she cites on whiteness is uh, the film scholar Richard Dyer. And Richard Dyer argues, among other things, that in Western art and film, whiteness takes on spiritual and moral values uh, through visual representation. Uh, and he plays particular attention to the way in which the camera frames white faces and the way in which white faces sort of loom large in our cinematic uh, imaginary, uh, but also the way in which the conventions of Hollywood lighting uh, make whiteness uh, visible while washing out uh, and obscuring uh, uh, characters of darker skin colors. Um, of course, one could also investigate the contribution of editing. Uh, for example, is there a sort of rhythm or temporality uh, to whiteness? Is there a kind of whiteness in editing? Uh, one could think of, of sound. What, what, what does whiteness uh, sound like? Uh, or, or other formal elements like, like camera angles or, or what have you. Uh, how is, uh, and in particular, it would be interesting to think about how, uh, not just whiteness, but how is white disability represented? Does the introduction of disability alter or complicate the conventions for depicting uh, whiteness in other contexts? Uh, the second uh, point I, I wanted to make is, uh, you know, I wanted to ask uh, Professor Jacob Huey uh, about uh, what I take to be one of the, the central contradictions of the show uh, that she analyzes. Um, uh, for example, on the one hand, there is a really remarkable and in some ways unprecedented confrontation uh, with white privilege, yet over the course of this particular season, that confrontation largely uh, disappears uh, and uh, some de facto notion of, of, of white privilege 
uh, 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 reasserts itself. And so I'm curious about uh, you know, what one could say about the relationship uh, between, uh, between those two, confrontation of, white, uh, uh, of whiteness and yet the production seemingly of whiteness. Uh, could we explain that contradiction as a form of disavowal, uh, meaning uh, the, the Freudian psychic mechanism whereby a single consciousness can hold two opposing ideas at the same time without those opposing ideas uh, infecting each other? So uh, the sort of psychic logic in this case would be, uh, I know very well that white privilege exists, and yet all the same, I will act as though I don't know it. So is it a mode of disavowal, or is there something about the airing and working through and confrontation with whiteness that enables it to ultimately be dispensed with and for white uh, 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 privilege to reassert itself? Uh, the third and final comment I wanted to, uh, to make about the paper is I was curious uh, to hear more about how, it, how uh, the show might engage with or be in dialogue with a larger social context. And I couldn't help but thinking about uh, you know, what I know based on the work of Andrea uh, uh, Smith about the evangelical race reconciliation uh, movement, a movement whereby uh, racism among certain evangelical Christians can be uh, recognized and even condemned. Uh, Yet the response uh, or the, the cause of racism and the response of racism to racism gets winnowed down to individual acts of responsibility, uh, goodwill, etc., such that uh, uh, aspects of structural racism uh, are disappeared. And to the extent that a lot of the sort of discussion of race sort of comes down to uh, people learning uh, to be better people. Uh, in a way, that there's a sort of learning process that the BBF helps people uh, go through. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you know, there's some sort of connection there that could be made. Um, Amir Hussain uh, has given us, uh, uh, you know, really a sort of a, a very uh, a fascinating uh, paper that uh, you know is dealing with, uh, uh, an, an, uh, I think, an emergent scholarly uh, topic as more and more uh, people are turning to, uh, especially post 9/11, the way in which Islam and, and Muslims are, are represented. Uh, in television, and uh, you know, here, but especially in the longer paper, one of the things that I really appreciated was the sort of combination, which I think is uh, is, is, is really quite wonderful, a combination of um, of both uh, you know sort of textual analysis of particular episodes and shows uh, with uh, a sort of uh, analysis of uh, the sort of structure of um, uh, of the show, the behind the scenes, the role of of advisors and creators. So really sort of drawing upon the sort of paratext or the extra text of uh, the, the creative uh, uh, process sort of behind the scenes. Um, but I have a, a couple of, uh, I have a couple of questions. One, again, returns to uh, 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 a different kind of contradiction. It seems one of the, uh, the things that uh, 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 Professor Hussein's paper, uh, uh, one of the issues that it really foregrounds well is this sort of strange contradiction in, I take it, in uh, 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 sleeper cell, where on the one hand uh, you have uh, 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 the, the sort of you know real realistic or authentic details of, of Muslim life for the first time a Muslim hero, uh, uh, and if you watch the scenes of the show, uh, there really is a kind of pedagogical function uh, to the show. There are scenes that are clearly, it seems to me, included as little moments of uh, explaining this or that about uh, Islam. Um, and uh, if you go to the website online, there's even a, a little dictionary, uh, largely of, uh, of Arabic uh, words. And if you click on one of the words, you will go right to the scene where, where they're glossing that, uh, that particular term. So on the one hand, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sleeper Cell, certainly no Hajj better than Johnny Quest. Um, there's a kind of authenticity and a kind of welcomeness to seeing a representation of uh, given the paucity of representation. Of course, that goes side by side with uh, the kinds of uh, uh, stereotypes, uh, negative stereotypes, uh, that were so well analyzed uh, in the paper. And so again, I have a question about the, the relationship between those two things. How do they exist in the same televisual world? Again, is it a case of disavowal? Uh, or uh, is there something about the authenticity and the claims to authenticity that ultimately authorizes the reproduction of stereotypes. Uh, at any rate, it seems that one could say something about, about how those two things work together without uh, sort of exploding uh, the television show. 
Uh, the second comment I had had to do with uh, race. One of the things that, um, and you know, I think this is a sort of a, a, an emergent topic in, in what little I know about um, Arab American studies, and increasingly the way in which, especially post 9 11, people have been talking about the way in which Muslims and Islam uh, uh, has been uh, racialized, or it's linked to racialization, or its differences uh, as a sort of political uh, discourse or discourse of value. Um, and one of the things that was notable in, about the analysis of the show is the extent to which you have a kind of uh, 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 racial, ethnic, and national diversity to the Muslim characters that are represented. I can't remember if you mentioned this in this paper, but there's even a, a Dutch uh, convert. There's a Bosnian uh, Muslim. There's a, a Latino Muslim. And so I'm just curious, what you know is is the show given all of its sort of stereotypical represent or you know, reproductions, reproductions of stereotypes? Is it doing something interesting with race? Is it decoupling Islam from particular racializations? Uh, so, I, you know, just in general, I'm curious what, you know, what, the, what the show is doing with race. Um, and finally, I was really interested in, you know, as somebody who studies in part Latin American, uh, or immigration from Latin America to the United States, I was struck by the fact that uh, uh, Sleeper Cell has a Latino character based on uh, uh, Padilla. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, you know, oh, what, what, could be, what could be said about that? It made me really start to think about what scholars and activists are beginning to call the military immigration uh, complex. Um, and of course, the military uh, immigration complex uh, affects all sorts of immigrants, uh, but still largely, uh, in many ways, affects uh, immigrants from uh, Latin America. So about a year ago, uh, there was, at the time, the largest single site US immigration raid in the United States in a small town uh, meatpacking plant in Iowa. Uh, I say it used to be the largest because we recently had the new largest. I think it was in Pennsylvania. So, uh, you know, within like three years, we've had the two largest of these uh, sorts of raids. Uh, you know, large numbers of Latin American workers were, uh, were rounded up. Uh, they were held uh, in captivity in uh, uh, the uh, cattle holding pens of the local uh, uh, fairgrounds. Uh, they were eventually uh, chained at the waist and at the ankles. Uh, no yellow jumpsuits, but but you know where I'm going, and, and they were uh, sort of marched into court, makeshift courts, for uh, their immigration hearings. Uh, uh, I think around 300 of them or so were uh, deported. Well, not deported, first uh, punished. So now what happens uh, before someone is deported, uh, one is punished for being in the country illegally, so they serve several months in jail, uh, and then will be deported. So, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's not Gitmo uh, yet, uh, but there do seem to be, you know, possible points of convergence. Uh, we really are, with, in terms of immigration, moving in uh, a, a kind of uh, Guantanamo uh, uh, direction. Uh, and I'm curious if, if the show, uh, or in your analysis of the show, if there are potential uh, interfaces. Uh, finally, unfortunately, Rudy uh, uh, Busto, as I noted, could, uh, could not be here, and I really can't, uh, you know, do uh, justice to it. You know, in, in keeping with such a complex show like Heroes, his paper is uh, quite uh, complex uh, and uh, really fascinating. Uh, and, you know, I can't do all of the, uh, the details, but let me just you know, sort of briefly summarize what I take to be the thesis of the paper. And I think it's quite an interesting thesis. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Busto argues is that uh, the world of heroes uh, represents an apocalypse, but it's a, it's a, it comes from the perspective of a secular uh, apocalypse. Um, and you know, part of uh, uh, you know, what he means by that is it's, it's like a, a natural or human-made uh, disaster. And from the perspective of a sort of secular uh, apocalypse, uh, uh, he wants to argue, what that means is if there is no sort of transcendental agent either causing the problem or that can be appealed to to address the problem, then it becomes the responsibility of human agency, uh, uh, albeit uh, superhuman agency in the form of the heroes. So he's really reading, I think, uh, well, as he concludes, he's reading heroes as a, a, a particular expression of, of US uh, uh, civil religion uh, in which uh, the values that are uh, uh, valorized or made heroic aren't transcendental religious values, but values of uh, responsibility, of hard work, of individual uh, human effort, as I said, I'll be it. Superhuman uh, effort, um, and uh, you know, part of uh, this whole sort of uh, uh, a mixed bag of, of civil humanism are the kinds of values that uh, that I just mentioned 
mixed with a, a kind of mishmash of New Age uh, uh, Orientalism, uh, which uh, sort of edges towards the spiritual and the religious, but 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 never enters in you know, fully uh, uh, into it. Um, and again, here uh, I see a, a, a sort of a contradiction that perhaps we can talk about in Professor Pusto's uh, absence. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that is interesting, well, uh, his notion of a secular apocalypse, for me, uh, immediately resonated uh, with Walter Benjamin's uh, 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 figure of the last angel of, of history. So when Walter Benjamin is uh, explaining his uh, perspective on history, he adopts a radically anti-progressive model of, of, of history. Whereas from the perspective of progressive history with its linear timelines, history looks like the march of uh, progress. Uh, from the perspective of the last angel of history, his figure for the kind of history he's interested in, instead of being faced forward, the vantage point of this history is looking backward. And from that perspective, history looks like the piling up of ruin after ruin after ruin. In other words, it starts to look like a, a, a secular uh, apocalypse, as described uh, by Rudy Gusto. And in Benjamin's account, this model of thinking of history, that he calls historical materialism, is dramatically opposed to all sorts of progressive narratives, whether they be Christian teleological progressive narratives or enlightenment views about the inherently improving and progressive nature of human history. So it's opposed to both religious and secular models of progress. And in Busto's account, one of the things that is, is, is fascinating, I think, is that you have this kind of contradiction he sees in, uh, in Heroes, where on the one hand, you have the secular apocalypse, which in his account deranges the uh, linear time of, of, of the Christian apocalypse, um, at the same time as the show is, in his account, deeply invested in modes of progress, which while they are not expressively, expressively Christian or religious modes of progress, at some level start to uh, uh, blur that line in a way that would make you want to push on the, the notion of the secular. In other words, one of the things he notes is that the show has a remarkable amount of faith in the ability of Japanese or other immigrants to in some way assimilate or be incorporated with the United States, and an incredible faith in the power of science and technology to help humans solve those problems, not expressly religious, but still this incredible like, investment in progress that in some way is at right angles to uh, uh, the emphasis on, um, on a secular apocalypse that supposedly deranges all notions of progress. So I'd be curious to know from Professor Busto how, um, or from anyone who has any ideas, uh, uh, you know, how those two things get uh, reconciled or if, or if they do it all. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Do either of you want to respond to any of Curtis's points, or should we open up the floor for questions for the time we have left? I, I just want to thank Curtis uh, for that. I mean, I, one of the real pleasures of this conference has been uh, responding to it, actually taking it seriously with their tasks. So, so thank you so much uh, uh, for that. And I think just, just very quickly, that, that first part, the authentic stuff, that, that's what almost bothered me as a viewer. Is like, you, know, you get these things right, so it's almost like you should know better. And so when you get those things wrong, it becomes all that uh, more frustrating. Uh, the, the race issues is a great one, and I think that, that is one of the great strengths of the show, to say that Muslims aren't all the same. Here's this Dutch woman who's a Muslim, here's this Latino who's a Muslim, here's this Bosnian who's a Muslim, who's a Muslim, who's a Muslim, who's a Muslim, in that sense, it looks uh, well. I want to thank you, too, as well, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to respond to one of the things you say, you know, what was it, maybe there was something about me that allowed me to focus in on Rebecca's case, so and uh, I think there may be something true to that. There, there were two, I, I could call them very special fans because they were responsible for reviewing uh, the series for TV with LP and uh, uh, another place. I, they, their reviews were actually quite intimidating because <laughs> they were so detailed and passionate and were also erudite in kind of film criticism kind of way. And I looked at the way that they analyzed that scene um, where um, Kevin comes back and kind of checks uh, Andy and Rebecca, the puncher was this. And, and uh, they were both really pleased with him. Yeah, way to tell them, way to tell them. And uh, I think that there was a difference in the way that I 
appreciated her gaze and saw where her eyes were located, that hell might be come from a kind of linguistic anthropological focus where you look at gaze and silence and stuff, but also maybe my own positionality. And uh, I think it also got me thinking a lot about when I looked at the family views, there were critiques about disability can and should have had armrests, you know, for the like, first half of the first season, how we not have armrests, but not a lot of critiques around, around race. Um, so I, I wonder too about what people were taking uh, from the show and, uh, uh, in, in regards to race and uh, whiteness in particular. It was certainly a diverse representation of gods, but certainly Milty Pot God, but matters of race were not really uh, spoken. Yeah, I have a good question for the media answer on mirror along similar lines. But 
with uh, an atheist paper on saving grace, the Leon Cooley character, there's a story storyline where he converts to Islam. And they've done that, I think, in a very sophisticated way. And they've done that, frankly, in a brilliant way because the person that advised them on that was me. Uh, so, so I really <laughs> like the way they've done it there. And I think it's, it's a really good uh, part there. But I think those are the kinds of things we're saying. I mean, uh, Elijah and I talked about this, Tom Fontana on us. Uh, didn't set out to write the first major Muslim character on American television. It's just he's doing a, a story about prisons, and you can't write about American prisons without writing about black Muslims as part of that kind of thing. And so you have those. It, it's in the ordinariness that those stories are now not saying. Fontana never said, "I want to write the first major Muslim uh, character." I'm going to prison. Show. I was the Wednesday panel on that I got up there in television. And uh, Mr. Parsha had mentioned that um, season one, episode four, and the character that um, Dee right. programs, uh, Terry Salon. I was wondering about your comment about how it's not de extremizing Muslims with de terrorist terrorists. Yeah, and that had to do with not so much the, the thing there, but um, a comment, a commentary on the DVD. And so, you know, one of the great privileges, of course, of being able to watch the show later on DVD is all the extras, the, the director's commentary, those kind of things. And, and what I was talking about there was um, the commentary from one of the creators who talked about this guy taking uh, Muslims away from extremism. And you might say, no, he's taking terrorists away from terrorism. And, and then that distinction, now, that character, I think, is very powerful. And I think that's one of the ways which you can say, well, what in fact is happening in the world. Uh, we judge uh, Hamid al Hakam, who's uh, the character that in Yemen is actually uh, based on how many people are aware of that. Or one of the things I like, we did get to it here, but one of the things I did like about the show is, uh, I mean, Sleeper Cell, that you've got this Muslim who's actually working uh, for the FBI undercover. And the, if you look at the arrests, for example, and at the arrest of uh, the, like, the trials in uh, those two guys who brought to trial was because some of the Muslim community uh, informed on them. The reason that uh, Al Qaedan from uh, uh, San Diego uh, was uh, arrested was because people in the local mosque said, This guy's a radical. And so, you, but you don't tend to see that on television. So, the Muslim cooperation with uh, law enforcement, you know, and so those are the kinds of things that I like about that, that, that show to, to show that. I mean, obviously, it glorifies it with the, the Michael Lee. Uh, character yeah. Yo, what, what I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Here, and then we'll go to Sheila. Uh, in that movie that uh, you showed, uh, Ms. Jacobs, uh, you showed a black uh, female, but uh, what I see in her is what we, in my culture, call mulata or mulato. Because that's now where we're going with the candidate, who is perfect in the sense that he's white and black. So we would call him a mulatto. Right. But in our culture here in the state, we call that person black. Now, in that movie, I heard affirmative action and a disability and institutional racism. I think that in this country, we'll never deal with Asian racism. It's happened here in this institution, it's happened in the larger society, and we'll see it in films, and we'll see it uh, for some time to come. And this is the time where we are going to address it, because of the candidacy of one of the two men. Now, I also have here in my notes that the candidates, one of them is Hussein. Barack Hussein. So that also brings another uh, factor. Also, I heard that um, some uh, American blacks, or I want to call them Negro, you know, we use Negro in our culture, the Negro. Uh, we have Muhammad Ali, and we have Abdul, and we have these names. And there is a connection with my culture, because the Arabs were in Spain for some hundred years. So that's our ancestry. We're Jewish and Arab. We Latinos today. So the cultures of uh, African American and Latin American have that connection with the Arabs. 
power system will reach. So I'd like to ask now, uh, since we're also dealing with television, we had two actors. One of them was governor here, and he went on to be a president. We now have an actor who is the governor. That's the connection with television and the movie industry. I'm sorry that uh, Professor Busto is not here, but uh, the question I have is, uh, in view of these factors that I just uh, enumerated, uh, my personal opinion here is, are we going to deal with racism in our society in whatever time uh, that's coming? Anyone can address that. I guess the challenge you guys always face is question the way we want to. So I hope you indulge me because I can try to address it. Uh, well, actually, from what you said was uh, instructive. You know, Rebecca, I, I locate her as African American, but she's actually biracial. Uh, and there are ways I can recognize that aspect of her that ethnic identity. I think the reasons why I uh, meet her as African American is because she makes it relevant, not really as the, you know, I was a affirmative action queen. She could be referring to her gender, but there's an interaction that she has with Kevin one day where um, she tries to protect him by silencing somebody by saying, oh, he's, he's the cop, chief of police son, and he stops her. You know, and afterwards he says, you, you don't have to worry about me. I've been a cop's kid my whole life. And uh, he says, I think my father's going to do the right thing by something that's race reflective. And she said, oh, did I apply anything different? He said, no, I just thought it was inferred in there somewhere. And she responds, I've been this whole it's actually one of the times she uses kind of phonetic black English. She said, I've been this complexion my whole life. You don't have to worry about me where she's highlighting her skin color. Um, but she is biracial, and I, I can't help but share this with you. As I was listening to the DVD and the commentary of some of the actors, uh, she, she's also this kind of exoticized, beautiful biracial African American. If you look at the way in which Sydney uh, Portier's character is used in movies, she, she's fetishized very much as such. And she did not avoid fetishization by Joe Montagna or even uh, some of the female cast members who could not help but speak about how pretty she was and how beautiful her hair was and how all, all these markers of biraciality, beauty. Um, uh, oh, yeah, your father happens to be Cindy for you. <laughs> I don't know if I can, uh, like I said, I don't know if Joan of Arcadia can single handedly answer the question of racism, but you know, we can get enthusiastic about a lot of things. And, and uh, you know, I think it's important to see, you know, the, the marketing and can these shows be made, too much of a focus on black people. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to make that concession. Um, but I also think it's important to consider the ways in which, um, like even here, I think whenever there's been a question about race, to panelists so far on this day, people start talking about diverse characters. And they forget that race can be about whiteness as well. And so whiteness remains uh, unproblematized, it remains un. <laughs> and uh, I think it's important for us as scholars to be pushing uh, that agenda, not only in our analyses of these texts, opening up what race can be, um, but in our conversations with people who produce these kinds of texts. Yeah, I mean, actually, on that last point, I'm thinking about one show that did not get renewed on Showtime, which was Barbershop, which was precisely the white into at least one white character who's an African American. And um, which brings me to my main point is that a lot of things I think your paper, Lenita, um, shows very clearly is that there's been this great sea change, and that's happened very recently, um, in how race is foregrounded in television. Um, not all that many years ago, people were complaining about how segregated television would become, like you shows which were you know, all African American cast, all white cast. Now that seems to be, uh, that seems to be reversed. What is very interestingly, and I think that comes out quickly in Jennifer Arcadia, that something which producers tended to avoid was uh, interracial relationships. Now they're just all over the place. I mean, it's not just Joan of Arcade, it's here, and every sort of show has that. And I think it partly you can explain it by uh, it's appealing to a younger demographic uh, which uh, doesn't have the same, um, has not grown up at all uh, in, in an era of segregation. 
obligation. Um, but it, it does, it, the, the way you describe gender arcade is that it's interesting that it adds this sort of love relationship, intellectual love relationship becomes at a more foregrounded. That is when uh, the relationship, uh, the, uh, the, the, the race issues begin to take back burner and it becomes the, the sort of black woman in the supportive world of the white man. So, um, and I, I just wondered, you know, that, what, should you do? Like, what is your take on that? I mean, is it, is it the case that, uh, I think this is you know, perhaps in other shows as well, that, um, you know, how does this sort of, the sort of love relationship, the depiction of this supposedly trendy interracial relationship actually work as a sort of a way of cutting off the hard questions about race? Yeah. Uh, I have to say that I don't appreciate that Kevin Rebecca dealt with the, the interracial element. You know, it was that it was conceded as an issue that they had to overcome along with disability, along with the fact that she was more educated than him and she was older than him. So I was actually thought that was more of a realistic portrayal. Like, like let's let's not act like race perhaps is not relevant for them in some way. Um, but it was the kind of explaining in a way as the specter of sexual desire mounted between them. Uh, you think, you know, at, at some point like, you know, they should make it, <laughs> you know, they, 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 she seems willing to work with them. They, they seem really desperate together. They have sex, so they figure that thing out. You know, they do it, but then at the end of the show, he ends up having sex with uh, this, this uh, woman who happens to be white that he interviews, and uh, their relationship dissolves, and he goes on to have a, a flurry of um, white girlfriends, one of which I think is would have become his fiance if the show continued on. Uh, and Rebecca is relegated to someone who was a, once a love interest, but who gets remembered in one scene as uh, a mentor. You know, so it's, uh, I was both encouraged by the ways that the show tried to complicate interracial relationships and the possibility of that, people working through difference uh, to come together and pitting their marginalization, trying to figure these things out. You said it's a love interest. But then just that. Yeah, quick, quick, quick. Could you, Heather? What? 